the Vice President of Policy for ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council. It's Mr. Lee Shulk with us here. Lee, how are you, my friend? Hey, Andy, I'm doing great. How are you doing today? Doing great. It's so good to have you back on the show again with us. We always love the chat. What a crazy time we live in. It seems like every year, whether it's because of we don't teach civics the proper way in school, whether it's because we just forget about this stuff, but it seems like every year more and more people forget that states have the ability to do kind of their own thing for the most part, and we continue to push for a centralization of power at the federal level, and it seems to be getting out of hand a little bit, don't it, doesn't it? Well, that's the beauty of how our founders created uh, the United States of America. It was that principle of federalism. And let's not forget that the states created the federal government, not the other way around. And so the more we can transfer that balance of power back to the states, as our founders intended, the better. Yeah, that is true. Now that we're trying to bring this back up and rebrand the uh, the way that we function under this concept of federalism, I know you guys are working on what the policy priorities need to be for many states across the nation. But talk about that. Talk about what we need to focus on this year, because we have an immigration crisis. We have crime crises. We have an economic crisis right now. Uh, it's, it seems like everything that we look at under the Biden regime seems to be getting worse and worse. What do we start doing to correct this course, my friend? Well, you're exactly right. And, you know, I think we were all reminded of all of the trouble that our federal government has gotten us into when our credit, uh, we were we were downgraded by Fitch ratings, the credit downgrade only the second time in the U.S. history uh, just a couple of weeks ago. But it's a great reminder that the real solution to what uh, is troubling our country is going to come from state capitals. It's not going to come from Washington, D.C., my organization, Alec, you know, we have the privilege of working with principled, free market, limited government minded legislators from across the country. And the other great thing about Alec is that they're constantly bringing their ideas uh, to us and sharing them with fellow Alec members, what's working and what's not. We're able to see quickly from the 50 laboratories of democracy uh, what we can get done to help Americans who Let's be honest, they're, they're suffering. We're all suffering under this permanent tax from inflation. Uh, and so I think that's a great place to start. You know, how do we implement pro-growth tax reform, for example, helping mm-hmm. Americans keep more of their hard-earned paychecks? I think that's a great starting point for all of us. Yeah, that is a great starting point. Inflation right now under the Biden regime is anywhere between 15 to 30 percent, uh, really 15 to 20 percent um, for overall inflation, near 30 percent for food alone, which is pretty disastrous. If we can have more of our money back, we can actually, I don't know, afford to live, which is a very difficult thing to do right now. Um, right now, there are a lot of states that are starting to look at going to a flat tax here in Kansas, where I'm based out of. We tried to do that last year as well, and it didn't quite work. But do you think that's a solution? To, uh, the way to go is to go towards a flat tax or a single payer tax rate or uh, for both consumers and businesses to try and just make it simple for us to function and know exactly what to expect when we see our tax money come out? Yeah, I think when you move from a progressive tax structure to a flat tax, uh, it's a great move. Uh, to help states grow and thrive. I think it's important when we do that, though, to make sure that we're giving a tax cut to everyone that's paying income taxes. So it it may not be enough to just flatten the the tax brackets, but let's also look at lowering the rates as well. You know, it was amazing. In 2022, we saw a record five states move to a flat tax in just a single year. And, you know, states have been taxing income since 1910. Uh, between 1910 and 2021, only four states had ever switched to a flat tax. But in 2022, we had five states do it in just one year. And so I think that was a great trend uh, to provide that tax relief. You know, aside from moving to the flat tax, though, going back to 2021, over the last three years, not even three years, we've seen a total of 21 states cut the personal income tax. Uh, mm. And a handful have also chipped away at their business income tax as well. Uh, so I think that is uh, a really positive development at the state. It's not a story that really grabs the national headlines enough, but uh, if you know where to look, there are some positive trends happening around the country. Yeah, that is some good news. In your opinion, which one would fare better with the states moving towards either a flat tax and a single payer tax rate like that, or getting rid of personal income tax and going straight sales tax only, which I know has been another option. And the National Sales Tax Group, I forget what they're called, just Sales Tax Organization, Federation, whatever it is, they've pushed that for a long time as well. 
Is that an option as well here? Well, no matter what type of tax you're looking at, I think we need to make sure that the rates aren't going sky high. They're not going out of control. But I will say that, you know, looking at decades of research that we've done as we've compiled our Rich States, Poor States publication, now in its 16th edition, you know, we're comparing all 50 states on their economic policies and what's helping some states grow and thrive and what's really hurting other states. We found that the income tax is a huge inhibitor to economic growth. And so what we often like to do with that report is compare the nine states that have a 0% tax on personal income, compare and contrast those with the nine states that have some of the highest tax rates in the country. You're talking about some of the usual suspects like New York, New Jersey, California, Minnesota. And I think it's amazing, especially when you look at some of the migration patterns uh, and you know, the states that are have the lower taxes, uh, these are places like Florida, no income tax. Uh, you have 300,000 people on net move to Florida in a single year. Yeah. And on the flip side, you had about 300,000 leave the state of New York. Uh, and so that trend is something that we see not in every single case, but by and large, it is those pro-growth, those low-tax freedom states that are starting to really grow, uh, whereas some of the blue states and the high tax environments, these states in uh, many cases are just bleeding residents. Yeah, that is very true. We're talking with Lee Schalk, Vice President of Policy for American Legislative Exchange Council, also known as ALEC, because they're getting ready for their big annual meeting this year on what the priorities are for the states. Let's shift away from economic issues for just a moment. Let's talk about school choice and education. We sat down a few days ago with the School Choice Awareness Foundation as more states seem to be focusing on this as a big issue as well. And I remember a few years ago, the big story was when Governor Scott Walker in Wisconsin took on the teachers unions to try and bring more school choice, to bring bring more conversation to the education conversation. And it led to about three different recall attempts against him because of how powerful those teachers unions actually were. Now we're seeing a lot of states make this as a serious conversation on school choice and trying to find ways to better education. Is this one of the top priorities you guys have for states to try and focus on this year? Oh, absolutely. And, you know, when you talk about school choice, specifically universal school choice and education opportunity programs, 2023 has just been a banner year with it seems like state after state, uh, following the ALEC recommendations, in many cases, ALEC legislators leading the charge on these issues. But Iowa is a great example of a state that got it done. Uh, Kim Reynolds signing the Universal Education Freedom Bill. We've seen other states like Indiana, Utah, Florida. It's just been a banner year when it comes to education freedom. And I think what I've heard a lot about is we need to start focusing on the students. We need to prioritize students and their futures as opposed to prioritizing education system. Uh, and so, you know, I think a lot of people are realizing that the status quo in education uh, is not working. Uh, it, we can't have a one-size-fits-all, uh, but we need to have options on the table. You know, public school might be great for some families. It might not be the best option for others. And so the more choice that we can provide, the better. And that has certainly been a huge topic of conversation among ALEC members, and really across the country. It's been an incredible year for education freedom. Yeah, amen to that. What a concept. More choices to get people the freedom to choose on how best to get their kids educated and take them to school in some way, shape, or form. I know that uh, here in Kansas, I know micro-schooling has become a big thing with uh, the community, just getting together, wanting to just bring the kids in the backyard and teach them about things on the side as well. I think that's an absolutely awesome idea, and I think we should see that being promoted across the nation as well. Got to take a break here. Uh, one more segment right around the corner. It's Lee Schalk with American Legislative Exchange Council, also known as Alec. He's the VP of Policy. When we come back, I want to talk some about some of the other issues they have. And we've talked a little bit about it on the program before with artificial intelligence, with the right to work. We see that UAW strike that's about ready to take place as of tomorrow. Ah, yeah, you know I was going to go there. We'll see if we can't squeeze some of that in. One more segment right around the corner. It's the Voice of Reason on a pre-Friday. Stay here. Lee, uh, we're talking with uh, Lee Shulk with American Legislative Exchange Council, also known as Alec Lee. I got to get your input on this one because is this uh, the right to work, I think, needs to be mandated for all states. And I know they're trying to push that in a lot of these states. A lot of them don't have it right now, but we're seeing a lot of people potentially walk off the line tomorrow because they want to be paid more to, to work less. And I don't know how that makes a whole lot of sense. 
Yeah, I mean, right to work laws are critical for for the 50 states, and we've got more than half the country that has a right to work law in place. But I'll tell you what, as we're looking at, you know, we talked a little bit about where taxpayers are moving some of the trends with migration. But you look at, especially during the pandemic, how many big businesses packed up and relocated. I mean, almost every single time you see a headline about, let's say, Caterpillar leaving Illinois. I mean, these companies are moving to right to work states. And it's really amazing if you look at since 2020, the, the top 10 states in terms of creating the most jobs, nine out of 10 of those states are right to work. Um, only Montana in 10th place did, does not have a right to work law. And so there's really no downside to uh, giving more worker freedom and not requiring union membership or any form of dues as a condition of employment. You know, more freedom, the better in every case. Yeah. Amen to that. If they do end up going on strike, I know this could essentially put a halt to a lot of auto manufacturing in the nation right now. We're already seeing some extremely high prices for new vehicles because of inflation, because of regulation on the auto industry, trying to push them towards EVs, trying to uh, the, the limit of supply that we have, the taxes that we're seeing on just the raw materials and the production of it. Could this potentially give us another shortage of vehicles after what we saw with the chip shortage? And is this going to jack up the price on vehicles if they end up going on strike? Well, that's a big question. I think there certainly could be some uh, some consequences if we do see that strike. And I think we'll have to stay tuned. Uh, but, you know, it has been unfortunate. Some of those things that we've been suffering through, especially in the last couple of years. Uh, and, and I, you know, I think with the government, uh, imposed lockdowns and economic shutdowns. We really haven't been doing ourselves any favor, uh, but this, I think, could be another blow. Yeah, it is unfortunate. Uh, last minute here, about a minute and a half, but what else is on the priority list for you guys? I know you have a list of like 23 to 23, uh, 23 to 25 different items for states to focus on this year. Uh, what haven't we covered yet that you guys really want to focus on come 2024? Yeah, you know, we continue to uh, talk a lot about keeping politics out of state pension funds. Uh, that's something with our model policy, the State Government Employee Retirement Protection Act, making sure that our states aren't investing uh, public pension dollars for political purposes. Another one that's been a huge point of conversation has been surrounding artificial intelligence. Mm. And, you know, I'm a big fan of the Terminator series, but we're not talking <laughs> about Skynet here. And, you know, as there's so much new technology as it relates to AI. Our position and, and the, the position of a lot of our members is that let's pump the brakes. Let's not overregulate a new technology, but let's also reject any attempts from the government uh, to ban AI or undermine free market principles within AI. So I think that's going to continue to be a huge conversation for the 50 states uh, and the entire country. Yeah, you really opened up. Last time we talked about that a few months ago, whenever it was that you came on and we talked about artificial intelligence, you really opened up my eyes and really brought a new perspective to it because I'm so like anti-technology. As a 34-year-old guy, I probably shouldn't be anti-technology, but I really am because I just don't like it. But you opened up my eyes and said that if unless we're part of the conversation in crafting the regulation and legislation for something like this technology, we're going to be lost away from it. And we're going to see kind of like what we see in social media where we're shadow banned, we're isolated, and we don't have any type of influence within it based on our conservative values. And we have to be part of that conversation. And I appreciate that. So I'm glad you guys continue to focus on that issue along with so many more with their upcoming 50th annual meeting with the states. What priorities we need to focus on going into 2024. Lee, it's always good to talk to you, my friend. Let's do it again real soon, brother. 